Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1. In this episode, I'm going to try and aim for the moon, but first we've got 31.4 science available, so let's go to the research and development building and pick up general rocketry because it's the only science that we can unlock with 31.4 science. It costs 20. The next tier all costs 45, so we're going to have to rack up more science for that, and hopefully the moon will help us with that. So I'm researching this. Now, I should mention the uses of some of the parts that we have already. Obviously, the basic fin was used to stabilize the craft. The capsule, you know, contains the Kerbal. The solid fuel booster we saw in action. The goo unit for science. The girder segment is interesting. I, I generally don't use that very often. Uh, a lot of people tend to attach things to it, uh, poking out of the rocket in an unsightly manner. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, there is the longer girder segment, which I customarily use to put the main landing gear for planes on uh, because it's more stable. You'll note that it also has a high max temperature. That could be useful in some situations. It could also be used for extending landing gear uh, if you want to have your rockets land back home again, which is an uh, interesting thing to attempt. The parachute, obviously. Uh, we've seen most of these parts in action already, the, the Science Junior, Science Unit, Communitron, uh, that's if you have a probe and you want to send the, send the science back, or if you have a Kerbal and you want to send the science back because for some reason you're not sure whether you can bring the Kerbal back safely. Um, I recommend that you try to just bring the Kerbal back safely. However, for probes, maybe you just want to park the probe in orbit somewhere, in which case then it can just use this antenna to transmit the science back. You will need power for that though, and we have not unlocked uh, solar panels yet. Uh, we got radiator panels, a thermometer over there, but for solar panels you have to go all the way down here to electrics. That's gonna cost us 90 science after we unlock this. So it's a long way to go to get solar panels and batteries. That's a battery. And that's the probe core that we would really like to use. There's a there's a probe core here, but it doesn't have the SAS, the stability system. So, oh, there's a small battery pack here. But uh, because it doesn't have the stability system, it's not quite as good as this one. So this is the one that we really want to use for our probes. Of course, in real life, uh, they sent out probes and uncrewed vehicles before they used crewed missions. But go figure, this is Kerbal, and the Kerbals go first. Now for the new... Uh, parts we are going to have this Reliant engine and let's go to the VAB to talk about the difference between this and the and the engine that we already have. It looks very much the same as the LV T45 but it has some subtle differences. So here's the LV T30 Reliant and the LV T45 Swivel. Now this is the one that we've been using. You notice it's 1.5 tons. The Reliant is lighter, 1.25 tons. This one, the max thrust in vacuum is 200 kilonewtons. This one, 215. And its sea level is even better as far as the gap between it and this engine. This is only 168, this one is 32 kilonewtons more. So it's very good at sea level, and it's got more thrust overall. Its ISP at sea level is 280, in vacuum it's 300. For the swivel, 270, so not as good on efficiency at sea level, but better on efficiency in vacuum, 320. So you would want to use this as an upper stage engine, if possible. The downside to the Reliant is that there is no engine gimbling. You see here gimbal, 3 degrees, that helps you control your rocket, and we've seen that in action already. This one does not have any gimbling like that, so you're not going to have the benefit of being able to maneuver your rocket with anything except for the the reaction wheel here, this torque, five units of torque. So that is an inconvenience and could could cause your rocket to flip if you don't control it properly. Now this is the previous configuration of our orbital rocket, right? This is how we got into orbit with all these boosters and all. We've unlocked a new tank. This tank here has doubled the capacity of these tanks, right? And if you take a look at the cost, these cost 150, so two of them cost 300. This one only cost 275, so we will definitely want to replace all of these tanks with these. So that's good. And there's no mass problem here. It, it is exactly double the size of this tank, including in mass. 
These are larger boosters, much larger boosters, and compared to the boosters that we have on here, they are more efficient, they have more power, they are not twice as powerful, just uh, about one and a half times more powerful, but their ISP is better overall, and so there's no reason not to go with them rather than these, unless you're trying to go within a mass limit, because in uh, career mode, until you unlock certain buildings, at uh, the next uh, level of certain buildings, you might be constrained in mass or constrained in part count, too. So you'll have to take those into consideration when you're doing career mode. So anyway, let me rebuild this rocket and see what I can come up with for a lunar mission, and then I'll talk over it. Alright, so what I've come up with is this. I just put it together really quickly. I have done no calculations. I have to reinforce and I have no idea whether this can actually go to the moon. Is it possible to make a more efficient rocket to get to the moon? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even with the parts that we have right now. But of course with the parts you get later on you can certainly do so. But I want to make a decently robust robust rocket to to demonstrate certain things. And first of all I've got the gimbling engine at the center and then the reliant engines that don't gimbal on the outside. The goal of this is to keep the center engine to where it's going to be higher in the atmosphere so that it can take the, get the benefit of its better ISP, its better efficiency there. We aren't even going to light this engine until we get to a decent altitude, so we're not going to have to deal with its bad uh, efficiency at sea level. Instead we're going to be, well, um, we'll be lighting it pretty quickly though before we try and make our turn because otherwise we might uh, be lacking in control. For the initial phase of flight though, I want to use the fins to just keep us straight. That's why we have fins on the boosters and on the center stack. I've opted for three boosters and that's because uh, our mass is about 48.7 tons and the three Reliant engines will have 600 kilonewtons. So that's well above, uh, again, multiply this by 10, we need at least 487 and we don't want more than 20 times that which would be about 960 and 600 kilonewtons falls nicely within that range. So that is why I've picked that amount and they'll be more efficient than these engines and certainly more efficient than the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters are nowhere near as efficient as these uh, Reliant engines. However, they do cost a lot, right? So it might be cheaper to use these thumper engines, but we'll try this out this time. The benefit to these is that you can control the throttling um, that's very helpful if you flip, and you can flip in this game, uh, your rocket may lose control and the atmosphere may take advantage of you. Now I didn't go up for two boosters because I wanted to balance properly on the launch pad, that's very helpful. And uh, I thought four boosters would be overkill though, if it turns out that we don't have enough delta V to get to the moon, then I will use four boosters. Now I've made a few tweaks here, the heat shield here, I've dumped half of the ablator. So I'm only carrying a hundred. I hope that's enough to bring the Kerbal back safely from the moon, but we'll have to see. Uh, this will be the stage that will get us to the moon. And we've got uh, three tons worth of fuel. Incidentally, each of these tanks, this size tank, has one ton of fuel. That's how much it is. So you can actually calculate your fuel very easily. The tanks themselves cost uh, weigh a little bit more than that, right? They weigh 1.125. But one ton of that is the fuel, and 0.125 is the structural mass of the tank. So let's save that. I do not remember which Kerbal we are on as far as who should go next. So I'm going to send Valentina, and we'll try that out. We'll talk about how to rendezvous with the moon in a bit. Let's just get into orbit first. That should be our first step. Can you directly go from, uh, from the ground to the moon? Yes, you can. Uh, yes, you can. Actually, this would not be the worst time ever to do that. Uh, if we're not going to make a maneuver node to see when we're going to hit the moon and everything like that, the general principle is that you uh, you burn for the moon when it's appearing above the horizon. And you can sort of see um, right right when we get around here, it's going to be appearing above the horizon. Now, if it takes about that long for us to get into orbit, then we could continue on to the moon without stopping our engines. But I prefer to get into orbit first just as a matter of safety's sake. 
Uh, Thrall is up. SAS is on. Valentina looks all right. Electric charge. Hmm. Electric charge might be a problem if we do a lot of maneuvering. It's already diminishing. Well, let's go. One good thing is that the engines sometimes provide electric charge. That's really helpful. Uh, we, we're tipping a bit. Hmm. I might want to light that center engine earlier than I initially intended. Yeah, okay. Alright, that'll give us the control to keep upright. Otherwise, it uh, definitely looked like we were tending to one side, right? Now we've got better control. Well, so much for my cunning plan. Again, follow the prograde vector down. In fact, I'll just uh, I'll just click prograde this time. Going past the speed of sound here, we're now definitely supersonic. Actually, I want to be on the lower end of the prograde vector now. Let me throttle down. We could follow the prograde vector down if uh, we are a little bit slower, but we're we're at pitch really high right now. Generally, uh, as a benchmark, I like to be at 45 degrees at 15 kilometers. So, like at 60 degree, uh, at about nine kilometers, I'd like to be at 60 degrees. I'd like to be at 30 degrees at 30 kilometers. So, obviously, we're pitched too high compared to my normal routine, if you will. Once we're above 30, I don't have to even bother with it too much. I can adjust based on how we're going. So we can flatten out now, because I, I, I know we're, we're already very high here. Look at our app waps, it's going 120-ish. Uh, so I'm just going to cut there. And we'll coast for a bit. We've got plenty of thrust. We're not quite where the moon is going to appear above the horizon. So, that's just a... Uh, oh, let me separate the boosters. So that's just a rule of thumb. The real way you would want to calculate a transfer to the moon, or anywhere else incidentally, is something called phase angle. And there is an equation for phase angle, but you can generally look it up on the web. And if uh, there are uh, numbers, like for instance, just to give an example, the phase angle for the transfer between Kerbin and Duna is about 45 degrees, 44 point something. And what that means is, if we're oriented like this, with Kerbin here and the Sun here, then Duna should be 45 degrees ahead of us, so around here. So this is not the right time. Duna is about 135 degrees ahead of us. Here, Eve is about, let's say, 10 degrees ahead of us. Moho is about 85 to 90 degrees ahead of us. That's not good. None of these uh, is the right number. Uh, Eve should be like 40, uh, 54 behind us. Uh, Drez, I think it's 82 ahead of us. And Jewel, if you want to get there, it should be like 96 degrees ahead of us. Those numbers are based on if the orbits are circular and there is no inclination. Oh, we're going down a bit. Let's just make orbit. So yeah, those are estimates. Okay, talking about that, I've uh, sort of neglected actually making orbit here. We are now in orbit. Okay, so that's based on orbits being circular and having no inclination. Now, if we take a look, most of the planets in the system orbit the sun in the same plane. So you don't have to worry too much about inclination. The exceptions are Drez here, Joule has a bit of an inclination, and then Elu here has uh, inclination. If we zoom in, uh, Moho, you can take a look here, uh, Moho here has inclination. But they're not too far off. Uh, even Elu, which is, which is pretty far off, uh, isn't anything like what Pluto does in our solar system, for instance. And actually, our solar system is mostly planar as well. Mostly, you don't have to worry about inclination, but but you do have to worry about eccentricity. So, here you see that Elu is not in a perfectly circular orbit. It's sort of in an ellipse, right? Uh, Joule is mostly circular. Trez is in an ellipse. 
Uh, Duna here, close enough. Well, it's it's definitely closer to Kerbin on one side than the other. So that's an ellipse, and Moho is also an ellipse. So these are definitely not circular uh, orbits. And being that they're not circular orbits, the numbers like uh, 44 degrees for Duna, uh, 96 degrees for Joule, and stuff like that, those are just estimates. And what you really want to do is go on to Google and uh, look for a KSP Transfer Window Planner. And that will help you get your transfers down and very efficient without any problems. Uh, that will give you, you know, exactly how much delta V you need and the right timing. And oftentimes they'll give you a nice little uh, image to work with. And I'll show you that later on. But for now, it's okay to work with just the numbers. And uh, so you can look up phase angles for transfers uh, to Joule, to Drez, to uh, Duna online. But uh, the first one we'll probably aim for is either Duna or Eve. In Duna's case, you want it 45 degrees ahead. In Eve's case, you want it 54 behind. Okay. Now, the reason why these are the most efficient transfer windows, and it works for the moon as well, there is a phase angle from any orbit around Kerbin to get to the moon. There is a time to do that. I don't actually know the time to transfer to the moon off the top of my head because there are other ways of figuring out, like the whole going right above the horizon. It should be right above the horizon right now. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's actually a little bit past because I've been talking so much. There's also the fact that we can just add a maneuver, right? So here I've added a maneuver and I can tug on it and I can set the moon as a target. And in that case, but you can't always do that in career. In that case, now this isn't the most efficient thing. You see, I'm going past the moon's orbit. Really what I should have done was when it was right above the horizon, which is like right here. And here, or maybe, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, right there. So here, we, we just barely touch the moon's orbit. We're still a little bit past. So maybe it's a little bit behind that. Let's see. Uh, anyway, it's close enough. You do, really don't want to go too far beyond the orbit of the moon and try and come back. You see, we're going past the moon and coming back. What you really want to do is hit it right where your apoapsis is. And that would be the most efficient thing. And so what the phase angle calculation does, what those numbers do for you, is they tell you when you're going to need to go in order to hit it right after your apoapsis. And that will take advantage of the fact that when you hit the moon, when you reach the moon, you will be going in the same direction as the moon. See, when you hit your apoapsis, you're tending in this direction as well, right? You're coming around like this, going around. And right when you go here, you're moving in this direction. The moon is also going in that direction. That's really helpful to match speeds with the moon, right? It's like you're catching up with it. If instead you go really far past, uh, right now our trajectory is a little bit past. And so right here, our velocity is going in this direction, right? It's going like that while the moon is going like that. So the difference between those two, that angle there, will mean that it's going to cost a little bit more to get into orbit around the moon and that is the downside to it. But here we've got a moon periapsis here, so this is showing us exactly the situation when we get to the moon, and when we get to the moon we're going to be at 461 kilometers, which is excellent. Now if we didn't do anything and we went to the moon and escaped the moon there in two days and made our way back, right now we would be crashing into Kerbin. Uh, that's what that line shows. We could tweak that here we've got this going here. Now that makes us miss the moon. But here, here now, we would actually hit the... Well, can I get in the atmosphere? Come on. It's a little bit finicky. You can use your scroll wheel to fine-tune it. Here we'll be hitting the atmosphere. And for a safe free return, I would like it to be under 30 kilometers, but over 25. So something between 25 kilometers and 30 kilometers should be all right. So here we've got uh, transfer over will be 376 kilometers away from the moon. That's not the greatest. That's uh, pretty high. We can adjust that later. And then we would be able to come back without doing any other burns. After this burn, we would come straight back 
and return back to Kerbin. Now, we don't necessarily want to do that. We probably want to get into orbit around the moon, but we should check out whether we have enough fuel for that, right? We don't want to do that right away. Now, Kerbin's other moon does have an inclination. You can see here that while it was easy to hit the moon, and the moon doesn't have much of an inclination, it's right at the equator of Kerbin. Minmus is not right at the equator of Kerbin. Minmus has a 5 degree inclination, so we'll need to do something fancy in order to hit Minmus. There are a few ways of going about that, and I'll show the easiest way, as long as you have the maneuver node system unlocked. Um, I'll also discuss how to do that if you don't have the maneuver node system unlocked, but that's more of a hit or miss sort of thing. Okay, and the only time you wouldn't have the the maneuver node system unlocked is if you are in career mode. So anyway, we've plotted a node, and so I'm going to time warp to it so that we can transfer over to the moon. I should have dumped the mop repellent, I always forget that. Okay, so now we're going to rely on the reaction wheel torque in the command pod to turn us to the maneuver node, so I'm going to click maneuver. And we see that it's going to take 826 meters per second, which is, as I've said before, quite normal. Anything between 800 and 850 is a normal transfer to the moon. If you're taking much more than that, you are probably doing it wrong. If you take less than that, you're probably in a higher orbit around Kerbin. Now we want to do part of the burn earlier, so we might as well start now, get rid of the stage, and ignite. Okay, so now we've started the burn, and our hope is to be halfway through the burn by the time we get to the node. That might not happen, because I'm thrust limited here. Maybe I should tune that up a bit. Eh, we won't quite make it uh, as closely, but fortunately, the moon's sphere of influence, and the sphere of influence is the area in which it says moon encounter and moon escape. That's where we're under the moon's gravity. In Kerbal Space Program, it only carry, uh, calculates the gravity on your vessel from one celestial orbit uh, object at a time. So right now we're under Kerbin's gravity, but it's not detecting the moon's gravity. Once we get into that moon encounter, we're in the moon's sphere of influence, and then it will detect the moon's gravity, but not Kerbin's gravity. This method of dealing with gravity is known as patched conics. It is a good approximation, though uh, in certain circumstances you want better approximations. NASA would probably want a better approximation. Here I've left it loose on the Kerbin periapsis because I don't anticipate a free return. In fact, I'll aim to get closer to the moon instead of so far away. Alright, so now we're ready. I'm gonna just take SAS off just in case there's any electric charge leak from using it and leaving it on and we can transfer over to the moon. So here we go. Uh, transfers to the moon take about one Kerbin day or six hours. A Kerbin takes six hours to rotate on its axis, around its axis, so that is a Kerbin day. So here we go, we're about to enter the moon's sphere of influence. You can see we're going fairly slow by the way. At this point in our orbit, because we're in this elongated orbit, we're going very fast on the Kerbin side. We're going almost 3,000 meters per second, possibly more, probably more than 3,000 meters per second. But by the time we get to the moon, we're only going 184 meters per second. Now, when trying to get into orbit around uh, a planet or the moon, or any moons, there are moons around Joule, for instance, and you might want to get into orbit around those, you will want to do that burn at the periapsis, at your closest approach. We're going faster and faster and faster. Now there's something called the Oberth effect, which is the effect that going fast helps uh, as far as uh, doing burns. I'm not going to discuss that right now. But uh, we do want to be at the fastest point in our orbit in order to get into orbit around something. We are going about 800 meters per second, and that's actually around the moon, okay? That's with reference to the moon. That is not the same as the velocity that we saw while we're in Kerbin orbit, right? Right now we're uh, going a very different velocity around Kerbin. So let's not try and mix that up. So this is the velocity around the moon. It'll only tell us the velocity around the moon when we're in the moon's sphere of influence. Alright. And 
then by this we can see that our intended velocity around the moon, the velocity around the moon after we do this burn is going to be around 500 meters per second. So that's orbital velocity around the moon. Remember around Kerbin the orbital velocity was around 2300 meters per second. Now while this is getting into orbit around here, what we're really doing as far as Kerbin is concerned, from Kerbin's point of view what we're doing is remember we had that long orbit back there? Now what we've done is instead of having that long orbit we have boosted that side of orbit to match orbits with the moon. So now as far as Kerbin is concerned instead of having an orbit like this we now have an orbit like this. Alright we've made orbit around the moon which is a good situation in order to do science. So, Valentina, can you EVA for me? Okay, above the moon's east crater, keep the experiment. That's 14.4 science. We can do a crew report. That's near the moon. We should do far from the moon as well. EVA report. Highlands, keep. Board. So it's the same sort of process that we had around Kerbin, where we're trying to hit different biomes. And that was the east crater. These were the highlands, some around here. Mainly trying to hunt for craters. Now I know uh, some of what I've discussed might not have come across very clearly, so if you do have questions, please ask them. I have started a hard career mode uh, streaming on Twitch. We got Midlands there. So if you want to see how career mode works, you can hop by when I'm doing hard career mode. I'll put hard career mode in the title so, you, so that you know. My username on Twitch is the same as here. You can also catch the videos on demand. If you can't make the time for my streams, you can uh, watch the videos on demand for 14 days after the stream actually airs. So you don't have to worry about uh, catching me at the time, though in that case you won't be able to ask me questions directly. Still the Midlands. So yeah, that's the downside. Now I started streaming career mode and I promptly lost both Jeb and Val. So if you think that just uh, having thousands of hours of experience in Kerbal Space Program will keep you safe from your Kerbals perishing, you are incorrect. <laughs> Uh, things change in every version of Kerbal Space Program, and I uh, recently discovered that the terminal velocity, which is the, the the basically the drag through the atmosphere, has changed substantially from what I remembered between 1.0.5 and 1.1, and I didn't properly account for that fact. So, yeah. So unfortunately, I have lost some Kerbals as a result. Okay, it is the far side crater. That's very good. It's always something new. I mean, and that's what makes it fun. You have to be prepared to fail. I mean, you can't just uh, expect to do things perfectly the first time in Kerbal Space Program, or even the 50th time sometimes. Sometimes things that you have done over and over and over again, it doesn't turn out the way you expect. And if I ever think that I can just get by safely without thinking things through and being careful, unexpected things happen. Okay, well Val has just let go, so I've pressed R in order to activate her jetpack. I've been carefully keeping them on the capsule, but that's a brief EVA. You see I used 0.02 EVA propellant there to get her back on board. And all you have to do is use the W, A, S, and D keys, and then up and down is left shift and left control is the down. So left shift is up, left control is down, and that's how you control the Kerbal. Okay, well let's just board before she slips off again. I think we've got some signs here. I thought these craters were something else, but apparently I'm not hitting them right. Obviously we can get some more craters if we were at a different inclination. Now an inclination change around the moon is not as bad as an inclination change around Kerbin. So maybe we should do that. I mean we're missing this crater here and that crater there. I think we might have hit this. Uh, actually, you know what? Another thing is we're already at an inclination. 
all we have to do is wait for the moon to rotate. Right? Uh, see, this is rotating very slowly. And eventually, when it goes around here, our orbit will be touching it. So if we just wait, unfortunately there are the time warp limits. If we just wait, it's eventually going to go over there. So we don't actually need to burn at all. If you wanted to change your inclination, you should do so close to the equator. And then if I wanted to, like, go into a polar orbit. So we could hit the poles. Pull it in again. Because when you change your inclination and do that burn, you're going to add energy into your orbit, which boosts it up. So you need to pull it back down again as well. And so here we're in a sort of circular orbit going past the pole. And that costs 560 meters per second. I think I have enough fuel to do that, but I really don't uh, feel like this is the mission that I'm going to bother with that on. I think we've got quite a lot of science. And again, I don't want to hurry because there's a lot to explain. Okay, I know it's hard to see the crater, but it's right around there. So our orbit is now above it, I think. Maybe right on the edge of it. Even I can't really see it very well. Well, let's try it. Say right around here. Here-ish. Alright, Val. Let's see. Are we there? Uh, in space, high over the moon. Well, we haven't gotten that. Keep experiment. And actually, uh, Val, could you EVA again? I want you to take everything. Take all the things. Board. And now we can do another crew report. High over the moon. We hadn't done that yet. Ooh, that's a mess. Okay, well, that's something. But I wanted that crater. Maybe one more round will get us above that crater. Oh, it's because we are high over the moon. Okay, well, we need to bring our orbit down so that we can actually get the reading on the crater. If it's uh, too high, then we're not going to be near the moon and we're not going to get the biome reading, right? The high over the moon ones do not depend on the biome. Only the low of the moon ones do. Or near the moon. So let's bring that down. So again, my orbit's too high. So on the opposite side from the apoapsis, on the periapsis, I'm going to point retrograde and that will allow us to bring our orbit down so that we get closer to that crater. And if you haven't uh, been able to follow the planetary phase angles and the inclination stuff, don't worry about it. We will be doing planetary transfers, and I'll be able to show you all that stuff instead of just talking about it. And that'll be helpful. Okay, we should be above the crater now. Val, EVA for me, please. EVA report. Northwest crater. Excellent. Keep experiment and board. Okay, so that should do it. Now, we have to go back home, right? We made orbit, now we want to go back home. Let's say we wanted to transfer to Minmus, though. We do have enough fuel, I think. So, if we were aiming to transfer to Minmus, what we would do is, since we're going around this way, we would expect to want to depart somewhere between 4 and 5 o'clock. If you imagine a clock here, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, somewhere around here, we want to boost out. So I'll just click in between and say add maneuver. Okay, then we have an escape. See, this is the moon escape. And that will put us back into Kerbin SOI. Ooh, that's a little bit too far, huh? So we want to pull that in. And once again, we want to hit Mimus's orbit with the very tip. Okay, so now we see the orbit around Kerbin. So we're not leaving the Kerbin SOI and going uh, all interplanetary on it. So that's good. And here, what we see is this is our closest approach, but that's where Minmus will be at our closest approach. That's not good. So that's not going to work out. How do we fix that? Well, we can do that by moving the actual node here, maybe closer to 4 o'clock. Okay, but that doesn't boost us enough. Okay, closest approach, Minmus is over there. Well, you see the problem. Uh, we're not at the right phase angle, right? Minmus is not where it really needs to be in order for us to get to it. We're over here, so we're going too slow. Uh, by the time we get here, it's going to be way off, 
right? It's over here already when we're here. So when we get to here, it's probably going to be on this side somewhere. That's our problem. What we would like is if Minmus was over here right now, then by the time we get there, we would hit it. That's what the phase angles are all about. So what's going to happen is as we go around the clock and go to this side, right? This is now like 11 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, what we're doing is we're actually returning to Kerbin. Now that's only if you're going around this way. If you're going around the opposite direction, uh, the way to get back to Kerbin would actually be at 1 o'clock. And the way to boost out to, to uh, Minmus would actually be around uh, 6 to 9, around this side. So this is our return back. And since it doesn't look like we're in a good position to hit Minmus, we're not at the right phase angle, we will uh, bring our orbit in here. And so in order to bring your orbit tighter, you go faster, faster, faster and adjust. What you really want is this outgoing orbit to line up with the moon's orbit. That would be the most efficient thing. But you see we're getting this high inclination. Now we're going like uh, going inclined like that. That's because we start out with an inclined orbit around the moon. And so it's throwing us into an inclined orbit around Kerbin. And that's making it a little bit hard for me to actually bring the orbit down. But all you have to do is tweak it. See, I'm moving it. Ah, there we go. Periapsis now 30.5 kilometers. And again, I'm aiming for something between 25 and 30 kilometers on the periapsis here. It's a little bit touchy, and again you can use the scroll wheel, but 26.5 sounds fine to me. Now we're going around this way, so we're going to time warp through the 40 minutes. So, if you thought that you would just point at Kerbin and try and go back there, that's obviously not how it works. If we were to try and burn directly at Kerbin, what we'd probably do is we'd end up on escape. When you get close to the end of your maneuver, do pay attention to what's actually going on. You can just cancel it. Make sure you're pointing in the same direction. Take a look at the periapsis. Make sure you get it to the right number. You don't always have to tweak the maneuver node exactly. If you're paying attention right at the end, you can do the final adjustment. So if you get it close enough, you can you know do little adjustments like this. So here you see I was a little bit too close, I felt when I was uh, doing the initial burn, so I flipped around 180 degrees to the opposite side on the nav ball, which was close to my retrograde marker, and I lifted the orbit up. So again, uh, here, if I wanted to uh, lift the orbit up even more, I could do that. Now I'm at 30. Then I could flip back around. And if I do this, I bring it down again. And so that's how you do minor adjustments. That's one way of doing minor adjustments. If you don't have uh, finer control rockets like an RCS thruster or something like that. Okay. Well, now we're ready to go back home. So we time warp. And we're going to leave the sphere of influence of the moon. We've already done the high reading. I was originally going to do the high over the moon reading on this leg of the journey. But we've already got the high over the moon reading. So this should be fine. I have uh, inversed the orbit tendency, so the bold part is where we are headed. The faded part is the part behind the next orbit. It doesn't matter that we're in the inclination around Kerbin. It is inconvenient if you want to go back to the KSC, but it really doesn't matter to me in this case where I'm going to land. As long as we get Valentina back safely, it's all right. What I really don't want to do is hit a mountain, though. That wouldn't be nice. I'm not entirely sure I'm totally safe here. We're going 3,100 meters per second now on return, so we're going to have a lot more heat to deal with. We've got this stage. We could slow down if you wanted to. But I don't want to because I want to test how much of later I need in order to make a safe return. 
So is 100 enough? Well, we need to find that out, right? So we're about to hit the atmosphere and I'm just going to dump this stage. Now SAS is being jittery again. So I'm just going to manually bring it there. Sorry it's so dark, but uh, it looked like we were approaching on the nighttime side and there's no point being picky about that. Okay, here we go. 3,200 meters per second. You can see a blader being depleted. Obviously, you don't want to come straight down, otherwise you'll uh, burn up. You will not have. You want to skim through the atmosphere as much as possible in order to help uh, slow down. The atmosphere will help you slow down, and that's what we're doing here. You can see the atmosphere and the drag is helping us reduce our velocity so we don't smack into the ground at extremely high velocity, which is how I killed Jeb and Val in my hard career mode series on Twitch. <laughs> so, so I will naturally want to be a little bit more careful about that now. Hmm? We are now going at velocities comparable to orbital velocity around Kerbin, so it took us that long to get down to orbital velocity. Now we're suborbital. We don't have a uh, little overheating reading anymore, so looks like it's going to be okay. Just worried about the mountains now. This, uh, I don't know. I know you can't see it very easily. There is a rough patch here. Okay, out of 100 ablator, we used about 58. 57.11. Maybe the first mod I should introduce is ambient light adjustment so that we can see in the dark a little bit better. I guess I can turn off SAS and deploy a parachute. You can see the mountains now, I think. But we're in a good spot. I, I, I'm pretty sure that Valentina can survive this here. Okay, so let me time up a little bit. Five day journey for her. Five Kerbin days. Next time we'll talk about transferring to Minmus and dealing with inclinations like that. Okay, there we go. Recover vessel. And there you have it. 106.2 science done. Just floating around above the moon. Very lucrative. Valentina is ready for the next assignment. Let's take a look at the tech tree this time. Could wait till later but let's take a quick peek now this engine is of particular interest you can see the the sea level ISP is horrible you would never want to use this in, in the atmosphere but the vacuum ISP is 345 and the best we had before was the swivel engine which had 3, 320 so that's a very nice engine to use uh, high up in our stack and in space Another benefit is that it has a lower max thrust. If you remember, I was thrust limiting the swivel on our second stage. Instead of using 200 kilonewtons, I was only using like 100 of it. And so an engine that only has 60 should be fine. It's lighter too. The swivel engine is 1.5 tons. This is only 0.5 tons. So that's something I really want. And so I'm just going to get it. This is a radial engine, which means we can attach it on the side of things instead of on the bottom of things. That'll be helpful for certain things that we need to build. Another thing that we want is the thermometer. Battery would be nice. The probe core. We can show how to use that probe core even though it's really really awkward. The reaction wheel, this reaction wheel would be nice because if we use this probe core, this probe core doesn't have a reaction wheel. We've been happy to have the reaction wheel from the command pod but this, if we're going to use this as a probe, doesn't have that. So this exterior reaction wheel will be helpful. But we don't have enough uh, science to get both this and this. But remember, this one gets us on the road to solar panels and the better probe core. So let's just aim for this first. And of course the thermometer. So we can get more science. Alright, so that is my current progress. Uh, the stuff to do with planes are in the center, so here there's all plane stuff, airplanes. So if you're interested in airplanes, you should really focus in on here. 
Okay, so on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please do leave them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like, and I'll see you next time.